and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and people that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're not talking about a bad business in like the ethical sense so much as a failed business. We're gonna be talking about Quibi today. For those of you that don't know, Quibi was an American short form streaming platform for your phone. It was launched in 2020, yet by 2021, it was sold to Roku. So how did Quibi fall so spectacularly? Was it simply because of competition? Did COVID kill it because people were stuck inside during the worst of the pandemic on their laptops and television more often? Or was there something else? Today, we're going to explore the reasons why. As always, let's start with the company history. Who founded Quibi? According to Business Insider, former eBay CEO Meg Whitman and DreamWorks co-founder Jeffrey Katzenberg started Quibi. They wanted to create snackable short content for smartphones, which in and of itself doesn't sound like a bad idea. Not to mention, with two massive established names attached, the project seemed likely to succeed and thrive. At least that's what major studios thought. At first, in August 2018, they called the 2B service New TV only to rename it to Quibi in October. Back in August, they secured over $1 billion in funding from names like Disney, 21st Century Fox, NBC Universal, Sony Pictures Entertainment, Viacom, AT&T, Warner Media, formerly Time Warner, Lionsgate, MGM, just to name a few. Variety wrote, New TV is aiming to launch by the end of 2019 with a premium lineup of original short form series comprising episodes of 10 minutes each. The service will have two subscription tiers, an advertising free plan and an advertising light option, a la Hulu, according to Whitman. The opportunity for a service focused on mobile entertainment is huge as the world's billions of smartphone users watch an increasing amount of videos on their devices, according to Katzenberg, formerly CEO of DreamWorks Animation and chairman of Walt Disney Studios. We don't consider this competitive with Hulu, HBO, or Netflix or the networks, he says. It's a completely different use case. Of course, there's nothing stopping Netflix, HBO, or anyone else from jumping into shorter form programming in a big way. Indeed, Netflix has already launched the comedy lineup, a series of 15 minute stand-up specials. But Katzenberg insisted that new TV will be fundamentally different, built from the ground up to be 100% focused on the user experience for mobile viewing. Purely speaking from a consumer's point of view, if I'm on my phone, I'll usually watch YouTube. And if I'm at home and the television's on, it's probably Netflix or some kind of streaming service. Hell, I even stream YouTube on my TV. But I don't know if I see or feel the need to have something like Quibi, but I could be absolutely wrong. After all, if these well-known companies were investing, then there must've been some clear potential for the service. Bob Iger himself, the chairman and CEO of Walt Disney said that, quote, "'Technology continues to open up new avenues for great storytelling, and we're pleased to be part of this promising venture,' end quote. BBC Studios also invested in Quibi about a year later in July, 2019. Another article from Variety read, "'The production arm of BBC Studios recently won its first commission from Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman's soon to launch short form platform for nature series, Fierce Queens. The company has taken a small stake in the business. BBC Studios confirmed the deal. We are pleased to have concluded an investment on Quibi and we both see good opportunities to work together on future projects, it said. It would not break out the size or value of its investment. And guys, I I know I'm a fan of weird things in nature and honestly, it sounds like a show I would watch based on the short description. So then why have I never heard of it until now? Well, that's where the next portion of this is to discuss, the shows that Quibi was promoting. Aside from Fierce Queens, a Steven Spielberg horror short, an action series with Liam Hemsworth, and a reboot of Punked had all been announced by mid-2019. One of these that was talked about quite frequently was the Liam Hemsworth action thriller, The Most Dangerous Game. Some sources even said that it was truly one of the best movies out there and for Quibi to exclusively own it, well, that was a fantastic move on their part. However, people complained about how the movie was released, one episode at a time over the span of two weeks. Many people tend to binge watch shows, especially when the pandemic first started, though we'll get to the pandemic's role here in just a little bit. And I don't know anyone that would willingly watch a movie 10 minutes at a time. More recent sources say that the movie simply failed to find an audience on Quibi. Personally, I think that if you're going to have an app made for short form content, then that's exactly what you need to make and specialize in. If that's your thing, then make it excellent rather than a movie that's divided into small pieces. Though of course, that's just my opinion. I'm not at all the only one that thinks this way though. 
Glenn Weldon on NPR said that even though the production quality was there, he didn't love the experience of following a story in a herky-jerky fashion, as he put it. Quote, the issue for me was that the episodes didn't feel like satisfying self-contained chapters. It felt like I was watching a movie and kept getting interrupted. Also, pacing becomes a looming concern. In the show Survive, for example, the premise didn't kick in until episode four, end quote. If you're going to do short form content, be sure it's suited for short form content. Many YouTubers like Rainbot, for example, have videos that are primarily under 15 minutes long, but they're meant to be that way. These are bite-sized stories. It doesn't feel as if you're cut off from the story when a video ends. Plenty of successful commercial shows are formatted this way as well, such as Adventure Time, which is mostly made up of 11 minute episodes. If Quibi wanted to have short form content that people could watch on their phone, why force an otherwise supposedly excellent movie to fit this standard? Of course, it's not as if Glenn didn't have good things to say. He praised other launching titles on Quibi, like Game Show, Dismantled, The Sauce, as well as Nightgowns with Sasha Velour for their potential tool. Lindsay Holmes said that The Prodigy, The Shape of Pasta, as well as And Music also proved interesting. When it came to the most dangerous game, she too shared the complaint that it was almost impossible to have an immersive experience. Some of these shows like The Shape of Pasta seem incredibly niche. Linda describes it as, the tone has a half seriousness that makes it seem at first like it might be a parody, which is an issue for a couple of Quibi shows. But this is actually a very earnest food show about, well, lesser known shapes of pasta. Glenn, when talking about the show The Sauce, describes it as, host Ao and Tio travel from city to city, pitting two dance crews against each other. Teams are given a song, three dance moves to execute, and 30 minutes to choreograph. The dancing is impressive, but the show goes out of the way to unpack the technical skills on display. Both of these shows are incredibly different. Everything they listed seem vastly different compared to the next. Maybe you could argue that's a boon to Quibi to have a wide variety of shows. Or maybe someone who enjoys dance will go on the platform, watch the one thing, then have no reason to stay because they're not remotely interested in the history of pasta or aspiring athletes or making fun of 80s pop culture. Anyways, first I took a look at The Shape of Pasta because it was just so absurdly interesting to me. Now I was able to find an episode online and I've got to say it's kind of funny in like a weird self-aware kind of way. The very first line in the episode is, sometimes tracking down a pasta shape is a little like solving a murder mystery. I've got to say, as silly as it might sound to hear about a nearly extinct pasta shape, such as the strangulette being made in an isolated community, I did love the show. I loved Evan Funk's dynamic with the pasta makers, his obvious passion and admiration for the craft, and it's given me a desire to learn to make pasta that I'd never had before. As for the sauce, and no, I don't mean pasta sauce, but the dance show, if you like dance, you might love this. Personally, I'm not really a dancer. It didn't really catch my attention, and I don't blame the show for this. I just, I don't think it's poorly done or anything, but the premise as a whole just wasn't for me and didn't attract a non-dancer background person like me. And that's one of the issues I believe Quibi had from the onset. I might've looked into Quibi for the pasta show and watched some of that, but there wouldn't have been enough on the platform for me to stay. I know this is incredibly subjective and I'm not saying there aren't people that have an extremely wide variety of tastes of things to watch, but I believe this is one aspect of the reason why the app could have done better. Even so, by June of 2019, they already had over 100 million in ad sales and by October, 2019, they sold out their entire 150 million first year ad inventory. TechCrunch reported that year. For an entirely unseen product, it's notable that Quibi is already sold out for year one. That speaks to its ability to sell brands on its core concept, a sort of Netflix for the mobile era where higher quality content is chopped up into smaller bites or quick bites and viewable no matter how you hold your phone. Advertisers are offered either a six, 10 or 15 second pre-roll spot before the Quibi content streams. And unlike on YouTube, there are some ads can be skipped after a few seconds or removed entirely by way of subscription, Quibi's ads won't have a skip button. Quibi also hints at a unique offering for advertisers saying it will be experimenting with a number of other innovative ad formats. In addition, Quibi is tackling one of the issues advertisers have with YouTube, where a brand's message is often run against extremist content. YouTube has tried to fix the problem with better controls and brands have at times left YouTube. Some brands even got together to form a global alliance for responsible media, which basically means they're ready to move more formally to fight this problem. It's no surprise then that these companies are willing to help boost a potential YouTube competitor, one which promises they won't find their ad played ahead of child exploitation or white supremacist content among other things, as has been the case on YouTube at various points. 
I know the YouTube adpocalypse seems like it was centuries ago at this point, but when Quibi was in its developing stages, this was something important they had considered. The content is important, yes, but would advertisers think of their content is crucial too. In 2019, some YouTubers were proclaiming the death of YouTube as they grew up after the fallout from the adpocalypse did change the landscape here. Whether or not you agree with that assessment, it seemed like a great time for Quibi to step in and create what Whitman called a brand safe mobile platform. Quibi seemed like a good position with brands, but that hardly matters if the brands don't have any consumers to advertise to. So let's take a look at how they did in regard to that. Did they find their audience? Quibi launched their app on April 6, 2020. Initially speaking, things were promising. Jeffrey Katzenberg believed people would come for their lighthouses, their serialized content from famous filmmakers like Steven Soderbergh, and stay for the quick bites, and then form a daily consumption habit around their daily essentials. Things seemed to go well as on launch day, they received over 300,000 downloads and hit number three on the App Store, which is fantastic, right? Well, not exactly. 300,000 may seem like a great number, but when you compare it to the 4 million installs Disney Plus saw in late 2019, it was clear Quibi was still miles behind their competition. Though they were doing loads better than HBO Now's launch in 2015, HBO Now was one of multiple ways to watch HBO content, whereas Quibi is or was the only available way was through their app. And as TechCrunch pointed out shortly after launch day, consumer demand for a mobile streaming service designed for our busy on the go lives where we only have minutes of downtime to spare is something that's no longer relevant in the quarantine era where we have endless hours to binge TV at home. And Quibi is currently without an AirPlay or Chromecast option, which makes it a poor choice for the stay at home viewing. Quibi should have held off the launch day or at least made their app more accessible to people staying at home. And this was in early April, 2020 after all, when quarantine was still in its early stages. Quibi's entire relevance at that point was dead to millions of people and streaming services like Netflix, Disney Plus, and Hulu grew massively. These companies had been their competition from the beginning. And now with everyone in the country being told to stay home, this was quite possibly one of the worst times to launch a streaming service for the on the go lifestyle. By April 16th, only 10 days after launching, Quibi wasn't even in the top 70 downloaded apps on the App Store. They were behind downloaded apps such as Netflix, Hulu, and some kind of ASMR app. They were behind that too. They were still number 11 on the Google Play Store, but largely the demand really wasn't there. Around this time too, in mid April, seemingly trying to scramble, Meg Whitman announced that users would soon be able to cast Quibi to their televisions. And hey, this is great, but also a little too late. Consumers already downloaded the app. They likely didn't want to wait around until soon came to enjoy their shows. So it kind of got left behind. We had always planned to be able to cast to your TV. So we're going to see if we can accelerate that in the engineering roadmap, Whitman said. We'll eventually get there, but it was never part of the launch. If we had known about COVID, maybe it would have been. Quibi founder Jeffrey Katzenberg told Vulture's Joseph Aladdin last summer that a Quibi app on smart TVs would be a waste of limited resources for the startup. As soon as you go out and try to be all these things to all people, you end up being nothing to anybody, he said. And this is what surprises me. Whitman says that if they had known about COVID when casting would have existed in the beginning, you can't tell me that by April 6th, the launch date, they didn't know about COVID. If they launched in late February, 2020, I would be more receptive to that argument. But as it stands, the moment quarantine hit in March, I feel they should have prepared and pushed the schedule back. I don't think that Whitman or Katzenberg is a horrible person for not including this, but I just think that they, like the rest of us, vastly underestimated the impact of COVID and you know, it it really messed up their launch. By the time Quibi did land on Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Google TV, it was October, about six months after the launch. Variety described it as being too little too late. They missed subscriber signup posts. They commissioned original shows that paid up to $100,000 per minute of programming, but at the time they only had half a million paying customers. Oddly enough, I've also seen somewhat conflicting statements from Whitman and Katzenberg here. According to one source, Meg Whitman claimed at the time that despite the pandemic, people still had in between moments at home, the initial downloads exceeded their expectations and quote, we don't actually think it hurt us, end quote. How can she say that while Variety reports they miss subscriber signup goals? Katzenberg, on the other hand, told the New York Times, quote, I attribute everything that has gone wrong to coronavirus, everything, end quote. There can be no denying that Quibi failed here. 
Its downloads were lackluster and it fell from the top 10 downloads in about a week after its launch. But whether or not that's due to poor marketing, it shows being a bit all over the place, the pandemic, or a mixture of all of that and more, I'm not sure I'm the person to definitively say. Still, I do think Katzenberg offers a unique perspective, especially when it comes to the day they decided to launch. The New York Times writes, Mr. Katzenberg, the one-time head of Walt Disney Studios and founder of DreamWorks SKG, was asked if he wished he had not launched Quibi when he did. If we knew on March 1st, which is when we had to make the call, what we know today, you would say that is not a good idea, he said. The answer is, it's regrettable, but we are making enough gold out of hay here that I don't regret it. Also coming soon, Mr. Katzenberg said, Quibi will be less walled off from the internet and users will be able to share its content on social media platforms. Quibi placed a large bet on news programming for a lineup of shows from NBC, BBC, Telemundo, and ESPN that filed under the name Daily Essentials. Interest in those segments has been minimal. The Daily Essentials are not that essential, Mr. Katzenberg quipped. Changing up content is just business, but his reveal that they needed to make the call on March 1st is telling. It shows that this really wasn't a lack of judgment issue when it came to COVID because quarantine hadn't quite yet begun. This was an unfortunate coincidence and I can't exactly blame Quibi for that. It's not as if they're an MLM, predatory or promoting malicious content. They simply entered the market at probably one of the worst times they could have ever entered the market. I don't know if I could blame COVID entirely, though I do think the company still could have done things differently, but it's not hard to see why Katzenberg does think this way. Of course, behind the scenes, there were far more to unpack when it came to the new streaming company. Lawsuits, employees stealing trade secrets, so let's get into that, shall we? Now, before we continue on, I am just going to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by the big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, well, what's the catch? It turns out there really isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. And by cutting out retail stores, there's no crazy overhead costs that get passed down to you in the form of mystery fees. Now, you guys know that I recently changed over to Mint Mobile and by recently, I think, is it been eight months now maybe? I don't know, I lose track of time in this panorama, but you guys know the deal. I've been using Mint Mobile for a bit now and I absolutely love the service, don't have a single problem and God, I'm saving so much money, it's not even funny. So all plans with Mint Mobile are gonna come with unlimited talk and plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts, or you can do what I did and change everything. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day money-back guarantee. So if you wanna get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, make sure you go to mintmobile.com casket. That's mintmobile.com casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com casket. This episode is also sponsored by Magic Spoon. Growing up, cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid. It was delicious and it was always there for you in the mornings. However, as I grew up and tried to like eat those cereals again, I realized like they're really, really sugary and it just did not taste appealing anymore. And that's why I'm super grateful that I found Magic Spoon because Magic Spoon is definitely a hit. They have zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. And they're only 140 calories, which is kind of awesome. They have obviously their best-selling four flavors that are available in a variety pack, which includes cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter, and the fruity one is my personal favorite, but they also have other flavors, including cookies and cream, maple waffle, cinnamon, and blueberry. And they taste much closer to what I remember from my childhood without giving me like a sugar overkill or just making me feel like crap later in the day, which is kind of a thing now. So if you also wanna get started and try some Magic Spoon, which I absolutely recommend, make sure to use my promo code casket at checkout and get $5 off any order or go to magicspoon.com slash casket. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll just refund you your money with no questions asked. So click the link below and use code casket for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash casket and save $5 on your order today. So now let's begin to talk about some of the secrets behind what was going on inside of Quibi. The New York Times article says, there have been other bumps in the last month. A tech company, Echo, accuses Quibi of misappropriating trade secrets and infringing on the patent for the technology that allows viewers to shift seamlessly between horizontal and vertical viewing. The activist hedge fund, Elliott Management, has committed to funding the lawsuit filed by Echo. 
I did take a look into this and found sources that detail the nearly $100 million lawsuit that Echo filed. They allege patent infringement because of the technology called Turnstile, creating months of legal battles for Quibi that continued even after they went defunct. Variety wrote, in a December 30th ruling, the federal judge hearing the case denied Echo's motion for a preliminary injunction seeking to freeze Quibi's financial assets, finding that Echo has not shown it will more likely than not succeed on its patent infringement claims. However, the judge sided with Echo in finding that the company's three patents at issue in the case are likely valid. In addition, the judge found sufficient circumstantial evidence to suggest that three former Snap, as in Snapchat employees, who had received an NDA briefing from Echo CEO Yanni Block on Echo's interactive video tech before joining Quibi, had engaged in theft of trade secrets. According to court's ruling, Quibi must inform the court and Echo of any sale or transfer of technology or intellectual property assets within 48 hours of determining to take such an action. So to have this filed so early on in a company history is not a good look. One source says that Quibi poached former Snapchat and Facebook employees to start the company. And at one point, Snap even listed Quibi as one of their core competitors. Snapchat didn't end up needing to worry about that as Quibi didn't last long, but this article pointed out how one of Quibi's standout features was this gimmick. The Motley Fool stated, Quibi's core gimmick is the ability to seamlessly watch videos in portrait and in landscape mode, but there's no proven demand for this format. Snapchat's videos are exclusively vertical, but Instagram IGTV ditched its vertical video requirement after content creators complained that they couldn't repost standard horizontal YouTube videos to the platform. YouTube also started allowing viewers to post vertical videos, but most of its content still runs in landscape mode. Verizon also chased the streaming video trend with Go90, which encouraged users to rotate their phones to watch horizontal videos. The platform, which was also initially backed by some big media companies, flopped due to weak marketing campaigns and intense competition in the streaming video market. In short, viewers tend to favor one format or the other, depending on the app. Blending the two is unnecessary, confusing, and forces studios to constantly center the scripted action on the screen so it doesn't get cut off in vertical mode. Ultimately, this is the technology in question that led to all these lawsuits between them and Echo. So while the lawsuit may sound a bit stupid to us or at the very least a bit frivolous, it does make sense why Echo would care so much. Now, this didn't end up doing them any real favors in the long run or giving them much of an edge over popular streaming services, but it is worth noting. Quibi has denied allegations of wrongdoing and throughout 2020 and 2021 when this comes up as an issue, but it just really isn't all that black and white. The judges found that there is some sort of valid claim here. So while I may not be familiar with Echo or ORTS, the optimized real-time switching technology methods, it could seem that Echo has a leg to stand on here. Now I could be wrong, but we will touch on more of this in just a moment. However, while this was all beginning shortly after the launch of Quibi, there were quite a few other issues as well. So let's get back to the New York Times article. A recent report found that Quibi had given away its customers' email addresses without their knowledge. As soon as we heard about it, we fixed it, Mr. Katzenberg said. Several executives, including Janice Min, left Quibi during its beta phase, and the company partnered with another key team member in recent weeks, Megan Imbers, a top marketing executive who declined to comment. A newly installed interim marketing executive for Quibi, Anne Daly, once the president of DreamWorks Animation, has worked with Mr. Katzenberg since 1997. He said the change had come about because of a difference of opinion about what the strategy would be going forward. Until recently, Quibi promoted its service as a whole rather than marketing any particular show. That strategy has started to change. Quibi began marketing their individual shows to try and appeal to consumers and give them more insight as to what Quibi offered. All of this really proves that Quibi not only lost their way, but they didn't even seem to have a concrete path forward to begin with. I was able to find an article in late 2019 about Diane Nelson, the former president of DC Entertainment, leaving the company. Though difference of opinion about strategy is a valid reason for quitting, I wanted to know if any sources could give us a bit more insight as to what those differences were. Unfortunately, the articles I dug up revealed as good as nothing. Diane Nelson, the former president of DC Entertainment, is leaving the company and her duties will be distributed across her team, Quibi said on Tuesday. No reason was given for her surprise departure. Nelson, a well-regarded former Warner Bros. executive who helped guide the company's DC Entertainment division, joined Quibi only a year ago and has been an important part of the Hollywood company's executive ranks. Diane Nelson has been a valued member of the team, helping us build a strong organization full of exceptional people, Quibi chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg said in a statement. 
We wish her well and support her as she focuses on other priorities and thank her for her many contributions to Quibi. Nelson is one of several high profile executives who have exited Quibi in recent months as the company grapples with the challenges of launching a startup and plotting a strategy to attract subscribers for its mobile entertainment offerings. I don't wanna say that this is suspicious considering I don't know what happened behind closed doors and maybe it truly was just the pressure of building a startup or maybe there was conflict and we'll just never know. The point is here that it just doesn't look good and it didn't bode well. Megan Embers, head of brand and marketing, left just weeks after launch, stating that she felt it was an opportune time to transition. Hell, even if people abandoned ship for no reason other than wanting to pursue something else, this undoubtedly left Quibi in a difficult position of having to constantly find people to fill these shoes. Not to mention, I think anyone can agree that many executives leaving in the early days is not a good sign. So for Whitman to be walking around saying that everything was according to plan, it just really makes it look like they're in denial. Though again, this is purely my opinion. Other articles at the time also point out that Quibi essentially had to change what they were about, these in-between or on-the-go moments just weeks after launch. Because of this, some of their novel features didn't translate well to TV screens and users don't wanna struggle with their television and technical issues for just a few minutes worth of content. Though Whitman said that the launch exceeded her expectations, articles from Protocol said, quote, to say things didn't go exactly as planned is an understatement, end quote. In turnstile, the patent technology they were getting sued over wouldn't even work with television, so one of the features or gimmicks they promoted was already dead. To weather the turndown, they began to dial back their marketing expenses, so even less people were becoming aware of Quibi than before. By the time they made it to televisions in October, as we mentioned earlier, they were already pitching the sale of the company to Apple, Warner Media, and Facebook, yet they were rebuffed. Recode from Vox called it a hard sell and said that they had well-documented failure to attract users. They added, there was a lot of skepticism in advance of the services launch in April, mostly because there hadn't been a successful example of a paid mobile only video streaming service. And also because there's no shortage of other video options these days. And also because contrary to Quibi's marketing pitch, which argued that Quibi would help people pass the time while they waited in line for a sandwich or for their coffee to brew, people have plenty of other things they can do on their phones and because far less people were doing this in 2020 in general, just to interject. Still, it would have been hard to find someone who thought Quibi would be looking for a way out just a few months after it started. Katzenberg, a Hollywood veteran, is a famously relentless networker and promoter who spent years putting this together. If he's eyeing this exit this soon, something went terribly wrong. Their shows weren't and aren't terrible by any means. Still, things looked bleak for Quibi and Katzenberg was looking for a way out and eventually they did find one. By October, only six months after they launched, the writing was on the wall. Quibi failed and as Katzenberg put it, exhausted every possible option available to them. This left programs in so-called development hell as some of them, like the daily programs offered to subscribers, had sizable staffs to produce series for Quibi and weren't sure where they'd go once Quibi shut down. NBC and BBC didn't comment on what was going on and one studio that was producing multiple shows for Quibi said that they were unclear of the future of their shows. Matt Rogers, who was the host of Game Show, wasted no time in pitching his show to Netflix and eventually on December 1st, Quibi pulled the plug and folded after less than a year of being on the market. Free apps like TikTok took off during the pandemic, whereas Quibi didn't even seem to stand a chance against it. About a month later, in early January, 2021, the talks began with Roku as Quibi considered selling their content catalog. The Wall Street Journal reported, Roku, which sells the most popular streaming media player in the US, is pushing aggressively into content with its own ad supported app, the Roku Channel, which offers movies and shows produced by other companies. A deal with Quibi would give Roku a roster of exclusive programming. As I said before, it's not as if people hated the show specifically. At least that's not one of the reasons I see cited in articles that list potential reasons why Quibi failed. I'm sure some people did, but generally speaking, Quibi had been able to get some incredible talent for their content. If Roku brought these shows up, they'd have a few solid titles to their roster with big names behind them. Within almost no time at all, they did exactly that. Within the week that the Wall Street Journal reported Quibi and Roku were in talks, Roku bought up Quibi's shows for less than $100 million. Although I know that sounds like a lot of money to us, it's really not when you consider that at one point, Quibi was paying about a million dollars per 10 minutes of original content. That's the $100,000 per minute that we referenced earlier. Gizmodo also reported on the situation this past April and said that Quibi content would become known as Roku Originals, which should, quote, mercifully allow us all to move on from the memory of Quibi's spectacular implosion, end quote. 
The 75 original debuts would also be ad supported and the article added, when Quibi shows do appear on the platform, they will no longer stream in that weird multi-format mode that was pivotal to Quibi's sales pitch for its service. Roku didn't bother picking up Quibi's proprietary turnstile technology or infrastructure, meaning we will not be prompted to physically move our phones or televisions to stream a series from multiple perspectives. This could be because of the lawsuit over the turnstile technology, or it could be because I haven't found any sources that really enjoyed this tech and saw it as revolutionary in the way that Quibi would have liked. Either way, I'd say this was a smart move on both Quibi and Roku's part for them to move on from this massive failure. Some sources in January reported that Quibi is still facing a lawsuit over this turnstile technology, even if it wasn't part of the Roku deal. One writes, on January 11th, 2021, Quibi filed a response to the amended lawsuit and reiterated that the company does not and has not infringed, induced infringement of, or contributed to the infringement of the Echo patents, saying that Quibi independently developed the turnstile technology because the alleged trade secret is not a trade secret, but rather was readily ascertainable by persons of ordinary skill in the pertinent arts. Basically, Quibi is saying anyone with a decent amount of tech skill could have developed the feature and that's just what happened. Quibi's lawyers are calling on the court to toss out Echo's request for money and an injunction. I haven't seen any updates aside from this, so maybe Echo will choose not to pursue f- like this further now that Quibi is, you know, kind of dead, or maybe we'll get more news on this in the future. Either way, I can't say with complete certainty that either company was in the wrong in this specific instance since there was no complete and obvious ruling. Of course, sources still speculate how Quibi failed to begin with, as it seems like a spectacularly bad business considering just how quickly it sank. NPC mentions that as much as the pandemic affected their launch, other issues with the app itself did not help them. NBC stated, "'People complained about the inability to screenshot content, which meant it was difficult to share on social media and generate potentially helpful buzz around the shows. While that's not the issue unique to Quibi, it was one more pain point that added to its vulnerabilities. Quibi did eventually fix the issue, but not soon enough. Not working with social media, launching in the early days of a year long plus pandemic, lawsuits over their technology and executives leaving. It was the perfect storm. I don't wanna say that Quibi was doomed to fail as I do believe this was more than Whitman and Katzenberg want to admit it was in their own hands. If they'd changed things early on, they'd maybe have a better shot at success, but I'll admit a lot of this was out of their hands. Ultimately, Quibi failed miserably, but hey, at least the shape of pasta lives on in the Roku channel if you wanna see it, right? Well, with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure that you're going to my Linktree link. It has a nice little organized list of all of my social media, including like my Twitter, Instagram, and Discord server, and other places that I'm uploading content like other channels or my Twitch. So thank you all for making it to another episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.